Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most fascinating characters of all time. Part of the fascination is the fact that although we know a huge amount about his intellectual processes, through all his reams and reams of notes, observations, scientific studies, detailed drawings, recordings of his findings, and drafts of ideas and inventions, we know next to nothing about his personal life. We don't know what his hopes and fears were, we don't know who he loved, or who he slept with, or why he did many of the things that he did. Among the mysteries surrounding Leonardo are those that concern his paintings. We think we know from a drawing what he looked like, but maybe we've got it wrong. We might be mistaking him for his own grandfather, or even for Pope Julius II. We think we know who was represented in his most famous painting, the Mona Lisa, but perhaps it's his mother, or perhaps it's the Queen of Aragon, or an apprentice known affectionately as the Little Devil, or even Leonardo himself in drag. The book, The Da Vinci Code, by Dan Brown, drew attention to some of these mysteries, and one of the mysteries in particular is the existence of two paintings of the same subject, and both known as the Virgin of the Rocks. One of these usually resides in the Louvre Museum in Paris, and the other in the National Gallery, London. There are all sorts of questions to be asked about these two paintings. Why did a person as inventive as Leonardo do two paintings of the same subject? Did he really paint them both himself? If so, which is the original and which is the copy? Since they are almost the same in composition, but have significant differences in detail, why are the details different? What do the paintings mean? Now, here is a potted history of the two paintings. In 1482, when Leonardo was about 30, he left Florence, the town where he had grown up. Florence was the centre of the rebirth of art and philosophy known as the Renaissance. Leonardo travelled to Milan, where he joined the court of the ruler Ludovico Sforza as a designer and an engineer, and in Leonardo's own words, one who could also paint. It wasn't long before he received a commission for an important painting. It was an altarpiece for the lay brothers of the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception to put into their side chapel at the large church of San Francesco. Leonardo didn't have the commission all on his own. There was a huge ornate wooden frame which was to contain several paintings and reliefs and this had already been created by Giacomo del Maiano. The commission for the paintings and the additional decoration went jointly to Leonardo and Ambrogio de Predis and his brother Evangelista, who seems to have been a gilder. The work was commissioned in early 1483 and had to be installed by December that year for the feast day of the Immaculate Conception. There was to be an initial payment toward the expenses and then a series of monthly payments totalling 800 lira with an agreement that a further large payment would be made once the painting was delivered. The sum of the final payment was left undecided but Leonardo and his assistants obviously anticipated that it would be more than all the other payments put together. There is good reason to believe that the painting was in fact delivered on time. The confraternity never complained that it wasn't, even though there was a lot of to and froing of documents. However, the later payment was not forthcoming. Leonardo and the Depredis petitioned for the next 20 years, until Evangelista had died and Leonardo had gone away to work elsewhere. Leonardo and Ambrogio de Predis tried all sorts of strategies, 
They started the negotiations at 1,200 lira, saying that the 800 had all been spent on the central work and they were out of pocket over the others. They said, well, if you don't like our work, then give it back. Ludovico, the Duke of Milan, appealed on their behalf. The King of France, who admired Leonardo's work, bought into the matter and sent stern messages. In 1506, some independent assessors were called in who said that the painting wasn't completely finished. As Leonardo was out of town at the time, Ambrogio took the painting away to do some more work on it and eventually received 200 lira, a far cry from what he had hoped for. That is not the end of the story. In 1625, a painting answering to the description of the central panel of the Milan altarpiece was described as being in France, at Fontainebleau. That painting is now displayed in the Louvre. In the 18th century, the Chapel of the Immaculate Conception at San Francesco in Milan was demolished, and in 1785, the painting that had been at the centre of the altarpiece was sold to an artist, Gavin Hamilton, who took it to England, where it was eventually bought by the National Gallery London. It was reported at the time as being in a rather poor state and as being possibly the work of a pupil of Leonardo, Bernardino Luini. Later, it was regarded as the work of Leonardo and his assistants. So how does there happen to be two paintings, and which one is the earlier? During the mid-20th century, the position on this congealed. The painting in the Louvre was determined to be the earlier of the two, because Martin Davies, the director of the National Gallery London, saw in the Louvre painting a delicacy which he associated with Leonardo's earlier works, those done in Florence. So it followed that the Louvre Virgin of the Rocks must have been painted soon after leaving Florence, or even, impossibly, before leaving Florence. I say impossibly because its size and shape and subject fit the commission that Leonardo did not receive until he was already established in Milan. The more conservative and generally accepted position is that the Louvre painting was painted in 1483 as a response to the commission for the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception. So why, then, was the London painting painted at all if the Louvre version was done for the confraternity? At this point, art history steps off into the realm of pure hypothesis. The theory is that when Leonardo said, well, give us our painting back then, he really did take it. And ignoring the fact that he had already been paid 800 lira, he sold the confraternity's painting to a different client. This left the confraternity with a big empty hole in the middle of their altarpiece. Leonardo and his assistants then turned around and painted another picture, more meticulous and more detailed than the first picture, all the time whinging and whining and petitioning the confraternity because they owed them money. This is how the hypothesis goes, with a little bit of embellishment on the part of the present author. So why not embellish the story? Everybody else does. Both art historians and the media continue to build on the hypothesis, treating it with as much respect as if it was an unknown provenance of these paintings and searching for symbolism within the paintings to support the theories, while at the same time selectively ignoring iconography that indicates very clearly which painting is the earlier, which was done for the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, and which was done for a different client entirely. Do I agree with the hypothesis? No, I don't. It seems to me perfectly obvious that the painting which was in Milan in the 1700s and is now in the National Gallery is the one that was painted to fulfil the Confraternity's Commission, was installed in 1483, unfinished, and was the subject of the continued dispute finally settled in 1506. 
It seems perfectly clear to me that the Louvre's painting is the latter of the two and is based on the London painting and not the other way around. The confraternity had no part in its commission as it was intended from start for a different client who had seen and admired the confraternity's painting. This is a much simpler hypothesis, but to accept it, one must accept that the Virgin of the Rocks in London represents an earlier stage of Leonardo's painterly development than the Virgin of the Rocks in the Louvre. I believe that an examination of the two works reveals most clearly which one of the two is the earlier. Why is the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery London the earlier of the two? When the painting was commissioned by the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception in Milan, they commissioned a team of three, Leonardo da Vinci and Progio da Predi and an Evangelista. Now the painting in the National Gallery shows signs of a hand other than Leonardo's. Generally, signs of a hand other than that of the master would lead to the work being considered a second or workshop copy. But in this case, it indicates the exact opposite. It indicates that this is the painting that fulfilled the original commission, which was given to Leonardo and two other people. Secondly, there is a trail of paperwork that supports that the National Gallery painting is in fact the earlier work, the original. Leonardo and his team pursued the confraternity for payment. The confraternity did not pursue Leonardo and his team for delivery of the work. The confraternity complained that the painting was unfinished upon delivery and after much negotiation De Predi worked on it in order to be paid. A story has been fabricated to support the idea that the National Gallery painting is the second painting. This story is that Leonardo took the original and provided another, this being the second work. The National Gallery's current version of this fiction is that the confraternity rejected the first painting for reason unknown. There is no evidence to support this claim. There is evidence that Leonardo negotiated for 20 years to get the balance of the money owed by the confraternity and that he suggested he might take the painting away. There is no evidence that this ever took place. On the contrary, the evidence is that the confraternity retained the painting and that negotiation continued. The likelihood that Leonardo painted a second work to get a little more money is ludicrous because painting that work, even providing the wooden panel and the paints, was an expensive business. There is no way that he would have painted a second picture if he had not been paid for the first. He claimed that the sum of money he was originally paid had all been spent on materials. He wouldn't have painted the second one unless he was guaranteed of getting more money. Under these circumstances, he must have painted the second one for a different client, a client that he could be absolutely certain would pay him. It must have been a second commission. The claims that the painting in the Louvre was the original and earlier work were made at a time when the two paintings had never been seen together and good photographic reproductions were not available let alone the scientific photo analysis available today. The claims were reinforced by Martin Davies, director of the National Gallery, from assessment made during World War II at a time when the painting in the Louvre was not available for examination. Martin Davies' opinion was based, of necessity, on paintings that were in the National Gallery collection. The works available for comparison included paintings from the workshops of Verrocchio, Ghirlandaio, Perugino and Botticelli. It was clear that the Leonardo had characteristics that differed from those paintings. When it hung on the wall adjacent to them, as it was in 2014, 
15. It looks out of place. Martin Davies, probably working from prints of the painting in the Louvre and from memory, determined that the sweeter, prettier, more delicate painting in the Louvre was more in keeping with the Florentine style and that the painting in the Louvre must have been done before Leonardo left for Milan. This is contradicted by the fact that we know the painting was commissioned in, in Milan. We know the altarpiece to receive it had already been constructed before the painting was commissioned and the painting had to fit. Kenneth Clark did not agree with the Florentine date given it by Martin Davies, but he hesitated to directly contradict his successor at the National Gallery in print over which was the earlier picture. The 21st century examination of the painting shows two underlying drawings. The lower drawing shows the Virgin Mary with her head turned to the left, her right hand outstretched as if in wonder or adoration, and her left hand on her breast in a gesture of love. Her gaze is turned toward the Christ child the figure of whom was identified in a more recent scan of about 2018. The second drawing relates directly to the present composition. So it is clear that Leonardo had two different plans in mind when he began the picture. He started creating one picture, changed his mind, and created a quite different composition. Changes to the composition, such as this, as well as pentamenti, small changes of a more minor nature, are generally considered as indicating that the work which bears them is earlier and more original than a painting which doesn't show any of these signs. A painting which is a copy of an existent work doesn't usually have pentamenti or major changes. In this case, since the recent discovery of the underlying drawings of the National Gallery, the National Gallery's position has been that Leonardo began the second composition and then, I quote, returned to a composition that he had already created. In the case of the Pentamenti, such as the changes to the fall of the angel's curly hair, the National Gallery says Leonardo discarded changes that he had planned and returned to the arrangement of the original painting, that in the Louvre. So we're to believe that he was going to make a few changes to Angel Schools, but then he thought about it again and he didn't make those changes, even though they were only very slight. Now this is absolute nonsense. Both the underlying draft of the earlier composition and the pentamenti of the second underlying drawing indicate that the National Gallery painting is the earlier of the two and that the composition of the painting in the Louvre and the fall of the angel's curls and are dependent on the final arrangement of the National Gallery painting and not the other way around. Three parts of the Louvre painting, however, differ very significantly from the National Gallery painting. These are not mere pentamenti. They are deliberate changes. And these significant changes are the face of the infant John, who looks younger than the Christ child, even though he should look older, the face of the angel, whose eyes no longer look toward the Christ child but outward toward the viewer, and the hand of the angel, which, in the Louvre painting, points at the infant John. The National Gallery's position is that these changes were made in the National Gallery picture, not in the Louvre Museum picture. However, by a remarkable coincidence, a detailed drawing exists for each one of these three significant changes. There is a draft of baby's face, which fits the Louvre painting exactly. There is a draft of the outward looking angel's face of the Louvre painting. And there is a draft of the angel's pointing hand the existence of these three drawings means that it really is unbelievable nonsense to suggest that the three changes were made in the National Gallery painting 
the drawings indicate that Leonardo made the changes in the Louvre painting, that his original composition was without the pointing hand, without the younger baby's face, and without the angel's eyes being to, turned toward the viewer. And that is why the three drawings exist for those three parts. Any other suggestion really does not make sense. And to keep insisting that that is the way it was is to pull the wool over the eyes of the public. And I cannot see why it is happening. Drawings exist that are related directly to the National Gallery paintings two compositions, the underlying composition and the second underlying composition which became the final scene which we have today. These drawings are not for small pentimentio changes, they are drafts of full compositions. They are on a sheet of paper in the Metropolitan Museum. There are four drafts on a single sheet of paper and you can see in these four small sketches the development of Leonardo's ideas. We can see him alternating in his mind between a so-called Madonna Misericordia, which shows the Virgin with her arms outstretched, enclosing the adoring child John, who represents humanity worshipping the Christ child. And the second idea was for a Madonna in adoration of Christ child with one hand on her heart and the other arm outstretched. Now that composition of course appears as the underlying drawing on the panel of the London painting. Various elements that occur in the final painting can be seen in these four small drawings. The outstretched arm, the hand held above a Christ child as if signifying that he is her son the distant landscape and the enclosed space which in some of the drafts suggests a stable but which of course was eventually transformed into a rocky landscape. The English art historian and expert on Leonardo, Martin Kemp, has suggested that this sheet of drawings is dated to the 1490s because of the presence of a small optical diagram Martin Kemp and I both agree that the optical diagram, because of its positioning and the way the other drawings relate to it, we both agree that it's the earliest drawing on the page. However, I disagree with Kemp that Leonardo's interest in all aspects of optics began at such a late date as the 1490s. When I look at the huge unfinished painting of the Adoration of the Magi, it is clear that Leonardo had a very strong interest in the closely related discipline of perspective drawing. So he was already considering how vision and landscape, or vision and buildings, relate to each other. He was already thinking in optical terms long before he started studying lenses and refraction and things of that nature. Now, on the subject of style, we now have the advantage of highly detailed colour photography to assist in the comparison of paintings. We can look at all of Leonardo's known works in a matter of minutes. While the National Gallery Virgin of the Rocks sits rather discordantly in the National Gallery's collection of similarly dated Florentine works, that is, when we look at it alongside Botticelli's Verrocchio's and other such paintings. Its subject is tonal contrast rather than bright pretty colours. But when we look at it, which we can do online, amongst Leonardo's other work, it forms a continuum. It does not sit discordantly when placed at 1483. We see the Ginevra da Benci 1474 to 78. Her face is pale with strong shadow, but it has the surface features of a painting from the School of Verrocchio. Leonardo was trained in the School of Verrocchio. The surface of the flesh shows every concavity and convexity of the face, and they're all defined by slight shadows. 
So her face is a mass of little dimples and protuberances. There's a drawing by Verrocchio, Herr Vorman, which is in the British Museum, that demonstrates exactly this method of articulation of the facial contours. This characteristic appears in Leonardo's earlier work, but it doesn't appear in any of his later works. We see that characteristic here very markedly in the face of the London Virgin of the Rocks, and the reason why it is so marked in that painting is that Leonardo has used a light and dark more intensely. The shadows are all more intense. So her face is really very moulded and dimply. And we don't see this at all in the Louvre painting. It's characteristic of the London painting. It is characteristic of Florentine painting of the 1470s and early 1480s. It isn't characteristic of the 1490s or 1500s. The Benoit Madonna of 1478 has taken a step forward toward the depiction of natural light, daylight, and the Madonna of the Carnation, which is probably just a little later, possibly 1480, is notable for the strengthening of the light and shade that falls on the two figures. This is uncharacteristic of Florentine painting of the 1480s. So uh, what we're seeing is a new understanding in Leonardo's work of the effect of daylight. And it has reached uh, quite a high point in the Madonna of the Carnation. But in the Virgin of the Rocks, National Gallery, it becomes a feature. The subject matter has moved from the interior to an exterior setting, a setting in nature. The play of natural light on the figures is a direct development from the intensified use of light and shade that he had developed in those two previous small Madonnas. The light and shade on the face of the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery defines the facial contours as per Verrocchio rather than disguising them as per Leonardo's later use of Svermato in paintings such as the Mona Lisa. When we look at later works such as the portrait of a musician dated from about 1490, we see the use of light to an increasingly dramatic effect. When we move on to the Madonna and Child of St Anne in the Louvre, a painting of about 1503, we find that the Virgin of the Rocks in the Louvre is very much closer in its lighting, its colouring, the treatment of the figures, the treatment of the faces, the way in which the brush is handled, the delicacy of it. Those two paintings have far more in common stylistically than the Virgin of the Rocks in the Louvre has to do with the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery. Despite their similar compositions, the two paintings are stylistically quite far apart. And because of the shift in style, I would put the London painting at a much earlier date than the painting in the Louvre. It's at a time when Leonardo's interest was the development of form through the play of light on its surface rather than a development of facial expression or the disguising of facial expression through the play of light on the surface. By the time Leonardo brought the Mona Lisa to the stage that we have it now, and having worked on it apparently for many years, it made a very strong use of sfumato to soften and disguise the features rather than emphasising them and picking them out in the way in which all the subtle features of the face in the Virgin of the Rocks in London are picked out. 
We move on to a question of gesture and symbolism. We know that the subject matter of the Confraternity's painting was intended to represent the Immaculate Conception, that is, the one who was immaculately conceived. This is the Christ child, and it is indeed the focus of the National Gallery's painting as Mary presents and blesses the Christ child. An angel supports him and John the Baptist worships him. The National Gallery's painting fulfills that commission and it also fulfills that the confraternity was established to support the idea that the Virgin Mary was also herself immaculately conceived. The painting in the Louvre provokes a great number of questions and it suggests in Leonardo eccentricity or possibly even heresy. We look at this painting and we have to ask why is John the focus of the painting when plainly the focus of the confraternity's picture ought to be the Christ child? Why does John look younger and smaller? Why is the angel directing us to the wrong child? Now, John the Baptist was a very important saint in Florence, but he didn't have the same significance in Milan. He certainly didn't have a particular significance to the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception. So there seems to be no good reason why their main altarpiece should focus so strongly on John the Baptist. This runs completely counter to the notion that this painting, the painting in the Louvre, which is said to be the commissioned painting, it runs completely contrary to any notion that it should be the painting that the confraternity actually commissioned. Why is the angel directing the viewer to the wrong child? Now we know from the Last Supper that Leonardo used gesture to create a narrative the symbolism of hand gestures can hardly be ignored. The simple and obvious explanation is that the Louvre painting is not the painting done for the confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, but that it was created for an entirely different client who wanted the emphasis to be on that second child in the picture, not on the Christ child. If we accept on the stylistic terms and in the terms of the contract, that the National Gallery painting is in fact the earlier of the two and painted around 1483, then we know of one wealthy prospective client who would have had the opportunity to see the work and commission a second. This would have been King Charles VIII of France who was in Milan in 1494 and whose wife, Anne of Brittany, had given birth to the Dauphin, Charles Orlando, on the 11th of October, 1492. Sadly, the little prince died when he was about three. What evidence do we have to support the idea that John the Baptist might in fact represent the Dauphin and that this painting in the Louvre had indeed been done as a commission for the King of France. Firstly, while the Christ child is clearly identifiable by the blessing that he gives, by his mother's gesture and the angel's support, the second child in the Louvre painting cannot definitely be identified as John the Baptist. He doesn't have the trappings that John usually has. He doesn't have a cross and scroll that John carries and he is smaller, not larger than the Christ child, but he's plainly a little person of great significance. This is indicated by the pointing finger of the angel. Leonardo da Vinci employs symbolism in many of his paintings. The symbolism, when he uses it, is not mysterious. It's enlightening. For example, Ginevra da Vinci has behind her head a juniper bush juniper being the plant that gin is made from Ginevra in the Italian. Mona Lisa Gioconda identifies herself by her smile. Gioconda means the joking one. 
Similar telling symbolism is to be expected in this commissioned work, and indeed, there it may be found. In front of the kneeling baby, in place of the lilies that would normally accompany an image of the Madonna, there grows not white lilies, but the blue iris, the fleur-de-lis of the French king. A second plant can be just as easily identified. The violets, favourite flower of Anne of Brittany, sprout in front of the Virgin Mary. When the National Gallery's painting of the Virgin of the Rocks is accepted as the work commissioned and painted for the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, then it stands as Leonardo's great statement of God's spiritual creation set in the context of his natural creation, the grandeur of the earth. It also represents a forward move in composition with a trapezoid wedge shape dominating and containing figures with an energy greater than the simple triangular form. The National Gallery's painting introduces light that has only been hinted at in Leonardo's earlier work. The figures are bathed in the clear, cool light of day. It is a light more intense and directional than Leonardo has employed before. It emphasises and models the figures. This characteristic of this painting was to influence not only all Leonardo's students, but many artists for centuries to come. Raphael, Andrea del Sarto, Caravaggio, Velázquez, Rembrandt, and onwards into the 21st century. If we accept that the National Gallery painting was the subject of the process of development for which we have evidence, was worked on by Leonardo and his team, was delivered but not quite finished, and was the subject of the dispute over the payments, then it becomes the work which was always in the possession of confraternity until brought to England by Gavin Hamilton. The painting in France has always belonged to France. It was commissioned by the King of France. It represents the Dauphin of France. It contains the symbols of France. And since its delivery, it has never left the ownership of France. It is my aim here to restore to you both these paintings their proper position and their proper significance. The Leonardo, the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery occupies a supreme place in the development of figurative composition and in the development of the use of light and shade on the human form and in the development of the figure in the landscape. It is a supremely important masterpiece which has never been recognised as such for as long as it has been in the National Gallery because it has always been downplayed as a mere copy of the painting in the Louvre. And I also want to restore to France the painting which belongs to them, the painting which was created for them, the painting that shows the Dauphin of France and as the Blessed Virgin, the face of little Queen Anne of Brittany. <laughs>